for Pat's Two Cents with God's Church of Love Online. And we are going to read Acts chapter 9, starting at verse 3. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man, which means he was blind, y'all. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, neither did he eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he had done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou comest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received me, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples, which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. I'm going to stop there. You know, we do not realize how miraculous God's works are. He can take your very worst enemy, y'all, and he can make your very worst enemy your ally. He can make your very worst enemy the one that God uses his miracle working powers through to bless your life with. So understand that there is nothing, nothing, let me repeat in case you didn't understand what that word meant. Nothing is impossible with God. There is nothing that he cannot do. There is no one that he cannot change. There is no heart that he cannot shift when it comes to attitudes. Let me share this example with you. Now, this is hot off the press, y'all. All I got was scripture. And I forgot about this, and it's popping in my head right now. There was a woman on TV. They televised this whole program. And this woman was a staunch racist. She hated everything that was not pure lily white. Everything and everybody she hated. She called herself a lover of God, but she hated God's people. <laughs> what an oxymoron, huh? But listen to this. Her son, this was crazy. 
her son came on the show and rebuked her publicly for having so much bitter racial disdain for all of the people on the planet that happened not to be white. She was hurt. She was hurt and angry at her son and they went back and forth and that was the big drama for the show. And when people were saying, how could you say that? How could you? And she was like, no, nope, no, nope, I don't want to hear it. I know the only people of God are whites and that's it. And I mean the show, they said, well, we got to end the show. We're running out of time. And then before the show was over, because it was televised as a recording, they left room at the end for the big surprise. The woman left the TV set, got in her car, didn't say a word to her son, drove off and on her road to wherever she was heading, God spoke to her audibly and said, I make all people equal. And that one moment of her hearing God's voice, recognizing who he was and understanding with clarity what he said and what he meant, she turned her car around, went back to the studio and told them, I need to make a public apology. God just set me straight. God can do anything he wants, y'all. He can reach anybody, no matter how staunch, no matter how hard, no matter how rigid they are. God can change a heart with just a word. Check this out. The woman got on TV, asked for her son to come on too. She publicly made an apology and said, I'm letting all of my fellow, I don't know if they were Aryan nation or what, but she said, I'm letting all my fellow believers understand what God just said. And I'm saying this publicly, hopefully it'll be enough for you. It was enough for me. And she said, God said, I made all men equal. And I have no right to be prejudiced against anybody. I have no right to hate anyone. And I ask all of you to forgive me. She was so humble. Her whole attitude, her whole demeanor was tender, was humble, was contrite, was sweet. She, was, she had what you call godly sorrow. Now, some of you who aren't experiencing the miracles of God working in your life, some of it is because you really don't have godly sorrow. You have regret. It's a big difference. But it's only godly sorrow that works repentance. Some of why some of us don't get the victory is because we don't have godly sorrow. We only have regret. And the whole time we're regretting and trying to walk away, we're looking back rather than looking forward. And what did God tell Lot's wife? Don't look back. And she looked back, longing for what was behind her, and God turned her into a pillar of salt. Moving right along to some more miracles. I just had to throw that in. That was what you call a parenthetical. That was an aside. All right. Now, we're going to Acts chapter 12. I had totally forgotten about that story, y'all. I saw that program way back, maybe 25 years ago. Can't even tell you what the show was, but I saw it. And that was beautiful to see her let the world know. Wow. That's beautiful. Okay. Acts chapter 12. Go with me there. See, these are the miracles that God is able to do. And sometimes... As the Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I believe that some of us are going to be challenged soon, soon, y'all, with the ability to raise the sick, 
raise the dead. Hello. Work, lay hands and work miracles. And the Bible says covet the best gifts. So if you don't have the gift, ask God for it. Ask God to include you in that number of people that can see miracles happen in other people's lives at your hand and at your word. That God will use you as a chosen vessel to work miracles in other people's lives. There's no harm in asking for that. Because as long as you're using the gifts that God has already given you, what did Jesus say? If you're already using those talents, he'll add more talents to you. But if you bury your talent, he'll take that from you and give it to someone else who's using theirs. That's in everyday language. Now, let's go to, we're at Acts chapter 12. Peter was put in prison. Not our Peter. You know, our Peter's online listening. But Peter in the Bible, in the New Testament, <laughs> was put in prison. And he was put in prison, of course, for his testimony to Christ. As a result, I'm going to start in verse 3. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. And these were the days of unleavened bread. Verse 4. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to the four, quor the four quaternions of quaternions of soldiers to keep him intended after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and the keepers before the door kept the prison. Boy, they had him on total lockdown, y'all. Verse seven, and behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him and a light shone in the prison and he smote Peter on the side. In other words, he tapped him and raised him up saying, arise up quickly. And his chains fell off. The angel did not need a key. You hear me? <clears throat> the power of God is the key. So the chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind up thy sandals. And so he did. And he said unto him, Cast thy garments about thee and follow me. In other words, get dressed. We're getting out of here. And he went out and followed him and knew not or wist not, that's what the Bible says, knew not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. Then <laughs> when they were past the first and second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. In other words, the gate just opened up all by itself, right? By the power of God. And they went out and passed on through one street and forthwith the angel departed from him and when peter was come to himself he said now i know of a surety that the lord has sent his angel and had delivered me out of the hand of herod from all the expectation of the people of the jews wow and when he had considered the thing he came to the house of mary the mother of john whose surname was mark where many were gathered together praying now, Peter knocks on the door, a damsel comes to the door. She's so excited when she sees it's Peter, she runs back to tell the group Peter's at the door, but she didn't let Peter in. So Peter's still knocking and they think she's talking off the top of her head till they see him for themselves. And Peter's standing there and they're, they're so elated. Can you imagine what that must feel like to see that kind of a miracle? You know that one of your brothers or sisters are incarcerated. They have been arrested because of their faith. And you know where they are. You know how bound up, chained up, and how locked down that prison is, how there's no escaping it. Yet he's standing right there at the door, or she's standing at the door. Can you imagine what that must have done for their faith? To see the power of God working against all odds, y'all working against all that's natural. Can you imagine that? That's beautiful. See, the one thing that we forget is 
<laughs> there is nothing, there is no human security system. There is nothing that man can do to keep God out. If God wants to penetrate any barrier that man has put up, nothing can stop God, y'all. Nothing. God is all powerful, all knowing. He's everywhere able to do everything that he chooses to do. And no monkey in hell and no dingbat on earth can stop him. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So when you guys get intimidated by the Lord, you guys get intimidated by the mandates and by all these little things that are coming down the pipe, seemingly making your life more miserable and more difficult. You remember who your God is. Don't forget that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can ask or think according to the power that works in us. Now, my question is what power is working in you? When you're out there dealing with these hard-headed knuckleheads, are you sitting there trembling like the leaves of the tree in the wind for fear? Are you full of trepidation and intimidation? Are you? Is your cage rattled because of all the chaos that's going on around you? Why? Why is that going on with you? Don't you know who your God is? God is the joy and the strength of my life. He moves all pain, misery, and strife. He promised to keep me, never to leave me. He never, never falls short of his word. I've got to fast and pray, stay in the narrow way. I keep my life clean every day. I want to be with him when he comes back. I come too far and I'll never turn back. God is. God is. Mm, mm, mm. Don't forget who God is, y'all. Don't forget. Because God is able. There is nothing impossible to God. All things are possible with him. Amen? All right. Let's go to Acts chapter 3. Because sometimes we forget who God is. We get so caught up looking at all these dingbats on this planet, all the folks we got to deal with, all the Satan's little messengers and imps in human form that we have to deal with on a daily basis. And we tend to lose sight. See, this is what happens. All right. Let me share this real quick. Hold your hand in front of your face. Just do this for me. Humor me on this one. Humor this old broad, okay? Hold your hand in front of your face. All right. Hold it far away from you. Now, this, what you're looking at is your problem, your challenge, your obstacle, the, the idiot that's on, on your job or at your church or in your house sharing the walls that you share that drive you up the wall that rattle your cage at every given moment that's your problem that's your worry that's your concern this is your circumstance that's got you on edge i want you to take that look at the room around you you can see the room everything's fine in the room nothing is out of place i'm not talking about your housekeeping skills I mean, no tornado has come and knocked down a wall or bust down your, your roof. Everything is fine in your house. Take your hand and move it close, closer, slowly, closer, closer, and closer until it's touching your nose. All right? See how well you can see what's in front of you. It hinders your vision, doesn't it? Double the problem. Put both hands and hold them close to your face till they're touching your nose. They're right up against each other. That's a big problem. Now you're in crisis mode. It's a crisis, and you're touching your nose with it. And focus on the hand, and tell me how much of the room and behind it can you see. You can go outside and do it, where the sky is blue and the birds are flying and the sun is shining. 
and you do the same thing. You can't even enjoy the view. Why can't you enjoy the view? Because you're focused on the problem. You have magnified the problem and it's so big to you that it's like trying to fight a Goliath with a stick of chewing gum. But you forget, you're not fighting him with chewing gum, baby. The battle is the Lord's, not yours. So you get up off of that Humpty Dumpty way of thinking and remember who God is. Now, let's read. Okay, I hope you did the exercise with me. Here we go. Verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple of the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb, lame, he was born lame, y'all. Mm -hmm. Which means the muscles have completely atrophied so that those limbs are useless. A certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms, and Peter fastened his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he, giving heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them, then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately, not the next week, not the next month, immediately, his feet and ankles, his feet and ankle bones received strength. That means all of a sudden, muscle was there where there was none. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for arms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Ha! Huh. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them on the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And of course, Peter set them straight and let them know, you know, this is the power of God. So the thing that we forget is we have this power in us. The same Holy Ghost that worked through them still works through us. How many of us have laid hands on someone recently expecting a miracle? How many of us have walked through the grocery store, saw somebody walking with a cane or in a wheelchair or blind, crippled, lame, whatever, and had the boldness to walk up to them and say, would you like God to heal you? When was the last time you did that? When was the last time I did it? I'm challenging all of us. I'm not just preaching to you. I'm preaching to me too. Because I believe what God is saying now is it's time for us to break out of our comfort zones. It's time for us to get up off of our do-nothings and do something for the kingdom. It's time for us to allow ourselves to be the conduits of the Holy Spirit, to be the vessels of honor God wants us to be, living holy, presenting ourselves living sacrifices unto God, which is the least we can do, our reasonable service, but so that we can be used by God mightily. See, that's one of the reasons you don't just allow any little, any little pet sin to live with you. You try to clear it all out because you don't want contaminants mixing in with God's anointing. You understand what I'm saying? A surgeon does not go from the nightclub the night before having sex with Mary Jane and Sue or Tom, Dick and Harry, depending on what their gender is, and come into the surgical room without washing, without having the right garments on. Uh-huh. We call them garments of righteousness. 
they call them the garments of a surgeon going in to do surgery a life-saving surgery on a person unclean unsanitized using dirty instruments no way why do we think we can do that with god why we allow ourselves to have our little pet sins well that's not that big of a deal well when god wants to use you to work a miracle that one little pet sin could get right in the way of it because god will not cohabit with our sins and god will not be a co-worker with satan working in your life at will and it ain't at his will it's at your will so now that i got to chewing you out on that one decide if you want to be used of god mightily because god is looking for people to use he's ready for the miracles to go forth now we have sat we have twiddled our thumbs we have waited for someone else to do this that or the other but one thing all those rewards that we get in heaven are going to be based on how much we put out here on earth if you sitting there doing nothing baby you're not going to get much of anything in heaven you'll get to heaven but all those beautiful rewards and crowns uh-uh uh you're going to miss out on that so my question is do you even if you don't have a heart and you don't care to do anything for the lord ask god to put it in you ask god for the desire for the fire to burn in your soul let that fire be shut up in your bones so you can't help but serve them you can't help but reach out to people you can't help but have compassion on someone that you can see is suffering you can't help but go boldly to them knowing that the power of god is available to you as it was to peter as it was to paul as it was to james and all of those in the book of acts do you want to be used by god how badly do you want to be used how available will you be to god from this day forward it might be a good time to pray a prayer of repentance and a prayer of submission to god's service however he chooses to use you wherever no matter how far or near he chooses to use you and let me share this with you don't let anybody out there hinder you there are some friendships and some connections you'll have to let go of because they could be in your way while God has other people for you to minister to. So watch the time that you use and the time you spend and the investment because God may have certain particular jobs and assignments for you, but you can't get to them for dealing with all the stuff. Some of you have family members that'll tie up your time with busyness and god may be waiting patting the table with his fingers waiting for you waiting to get your attention so he can tell you what he wants you to do don't get caught up in the busyness of this world because that's what satan will do to stop you from being all that god wants you to be be careful about that all right don't get caught up in wasting your time with time wasters either. Be careful with that. Ask God what he wants. Even like with me going to this school. There are a lot of things I could be doing. And I have to cut back on a lot. Because I have literally had to consecrate my time to the Lord. So that I don't get caught left holding the bag because I didn't do an assignment. Or I didn't feel like doing it. I wanted to do something else. No, when you consecrate, you take it more seriously. Consecrate your life. Consecrate your free time to God. And let him use you to his glory. The miracle working power is right there in your hands. Right there in your spirit. Because where the spirit of God is, God is. God is that spirit. 
And that means that you are the temple of God and God is working in you to willing to do of his good pleasure. Allow him. He's not going to do it against your will. The reason he was able to grab Saul is because even though Saul was wrong as two left shoes, he was willing. And that's what God is looking for. Willingness and availability. So don't think it's in your skill, your talent, your intellect, your ability, your charismatic personality. No. It's in your willingness and in your availability. Will you be willing? Will you be available? And if you're not willing and not available, but you want to be, ask God to make you, to shift your attitude in Jesus' name. Amen. Get ready, y'all, because the miracles are about to begin. Do you want to be one of those on God's miracle working team? Or do you want to sit on your do nothing and continue to do nothing? God bless you.